A discussion among Western allies over how to indirectly provide Ukraine with fighter jets has been overshadowed by concerns that any overt military support could raise the risk of a wider conflict. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg cautioning against anything that could escalate the war. NATO has a responsibility to ensure that this conflict does not escalate beyond Ukraine. Because this would be even more dangerous destructive and deadly for Ukraine and for all of us. And I'm pleased to be joined now by Wesley Clark. He is a retired four-star general of the U.S. Army and former NATO Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. A very warm welcome to the day, sir. Um, 23 years ago, in March 1999, NATO, under your command, intervened in Kosovo. When you look at the refugees fleeing Ukraine, when you look at these long lines arriving in Germany, in Poland, uh, does that bring back memories from those times? Yes, it does. And back then in Kosovo, NATO intervened. Now in Ukraine, as we've heard, NATO saying that it's best to stay out. Uh, how do you explain that to a Ukrainian family that is hiding in a bomb shelter? It's inexplicable to the Ukrainian family in a bomb shelter. I understand what the NATO Secretary General is saying. He's a he's a superb leader, and um, and uh, he's done an excellent job with NATO. But the truth is that NATO has to come to terms, and the United States has to come to terms with the implications of what this aggression means by Russia directed against Ukraine. The any negotiations will be determined by the outcome on the ground. The outcome on the ground is determined by the resistance of the Ukrainians. The Russians have proven themselves a relatively inept force. And I would remind our, all of our European listeners that escalation by Mr. Putin is not solely under the control of NATO. No matter what NATO does or doesn't do, Mr. Putin may decide to escalate. So it's imperative that we sustain the Ukrainian forces in the fight. The Russian forces are defeatable on the battlefield, and even if they aren't, as Secretary Blinken has said, Russia can face a strategic defeat over the midterm from this. And NATO what does that actually look is, like in practical terms, sustaining Ukrainian forces? That means providing them javelins, stingers, and as much uh, anti-air and air support as is feasible to do. So do as you support as the, a uh, no-fly zone in Ukraine? No, no, you can't do a no-fly zone because legally all the aficionados who think they know everything about air power say you can't do it legally. It could have been done before Russia attacked. But at that point, the nations of the world were not ready to believe that Russia would attack. Now it's not possible to do a legalistic no-fly zone. However, air support can be provided by nations who are willing to go in. These airspace, this airspace does not belong to Russia. I want to remind your listeners that this is Ukrainian airspace, and it's the president of Ukraine appealing for international support. So uh, nations should think about this. If their nation is under assault, they want international support. It's their nation. So I, I give a lot of credence and a lot of credit to President Zelensky. He's proved to be a very courageous leader, and I think the nations of the West have to find ways to support Ukraine. But by NATO sending in air power, that would mean U.S. aircraft would be would be need would excuse me would need to be ready to shoot down Russian planes. I'm not going to get into the dispute about whether U.S. aircraft shoot down Russian planes, wave at Russian planes, or avoid Russian planes. This is for the president of the United States and the official leaders to decide upon and determine how to proceed. What I will say is that the future of the West determines is determined in large part by what happens in this conflict in Ukraine. It is in the interest of every country in the West to support Ukraine on the ground. How we're doing that, that's up to the leadership. And uh, there's no point in, in someone like me who doesn't have access to the real-time intelligence trying to prescribe a military plan to military leaders who are under national political authorities. They have to know how to do that. When I was in uniform, I did. But surely sending in air power, I just want to come back to this point, that would mean um, conflict. I mean, it would mean that the United States and NATO allies would have to be ready to go head to head with Russian planes. And surely that would be an escalation that could lead to um, Putin, who has threatened, who has put his nuclear forces on high alert um, to come back in a way that it's no exaggeration could say could lead to World War III. Well, let me ask you this question. 
if after Putin has digested Ukraine, he decides that he wants to finish his political objective by rolling NATO back out of the other countries of Eastern Europe who are now hosting NATO troops, do we at that point say, oh, my goodness, since you might have nuclear weapons against us, we'll surrender? What do we do then? How likely do you think you that would to, be, that he would invade public, no. NATO allied countries? You and, our national, you and our national leaders have to realize this. Putin's objectives are not limited to Ukraine. This is about rolling back the westernization, the rule of law, the international order in Europe and the rest of the world. This is simply the first battle. It is the easiest of the battles to fight if our nations are unified and can face reality in this. If we fall back and are intimidated by Mr. Putin's threat of nuclear weapons, if there's nothing we can do to help Ukraine, then um, we'll be dealing with the next crisis on NATO's territory itself. So what do you think Mr. Putin has in his sights? Are we talking about NATO allied states that you think he would intervene in? Certainly, if you talk to the nations in Eastern Europe, they'll tell you precisely what their fears are. Mm -hmm. From as long as I've dealt with the Russians in the post-Cold War period, they've always believed that the Baltic states belong to them. And so does they that then think, think that... Moldova do you theirs. think that they Russia think is currently is winning on the ground in Ukraine? Russia's not winning on the ground. It's right now... Uh, checkmated on the ground, or at least checked on the ground by poor logistics, communications, and the stiff resistance of the Ukrainians. It's Do you not winning that to change? Yet, but it could change. The Russians uh, have no regard for civilian casualties. They do have a lot of heavy firepower, and uh, they do have an air force that could be more uh, deeply engaged. Uh, today, they're bombing civilian targets in Mariupol. Um, I'm convinced Mr. Putin's got an eye on the International Criminal Court. He's trying to steal Ukraine as quietly and quickly as he can using the threat of nuclear weapons, but he will use massive firepower if necessary. So it's we, clearly not going quietly. I want to ask you how surprised you were by the determination uh, of Ukraine's army and its citizens in pushing back against this invasion. I wasn't surprised by the Ukraine's determination or their army's effectiveness. been over there many years. However, I will tell you this. I was surprised by the ineffectiveness of the Russian military. All right. That was retired U.S. General Wesley Clark. I want to thank you so much, sir, for joining me here on the day. Thank you very much. Good interview. Thank you.